I've entitled the message, Conspicuous Christianity. Reading from the text then, in Jesus' name, he, Jesus, said to them, Do you bring a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let him hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. It's interesting in verse 24, where in our English translations, Jesus says, Care, or consider carefully what you hear. He's calling us to be attentive. He's calling us not only to be attentive, but to seek to understand. It's in the present tense. In other words, this is something that is supposed to mark each and every day of our lives. A careful consideration of that which we hear. And a place, going to a place where we're going to be able to judge and discern truth from error. It's interesting in the Greek language, it literally says, see what you hear. Interesting, huh? See what you hear. That means we should all have those cartoon captions coming out of our mouth, right? So we can all see. No, that's not what, what it means at all. The Greek word is blepete, and that literally means to see, but it also means to see with understanding. In other words, you give careful consideration to that which is before you, to that which you need to learn and, and understand. And so we are called to give careful thought so that we can see with understanding that which goes on around us. I think of what James writes in his epistle at verse 22 of chapter 1. He says, Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. Well, when we listen, we need to listen carefully, and we need to listen with the idea of putting it to use. And so these two passages would be companion passages with each other. He, we're, we're, we're being told here that our faith is to be lived out in our daily lives, and it's to be lived out in the open. There's much talk about faith being a deeply personal matter in our day, and that's very true. Those who speak of faith as a deeply personal matter are exactly right. But here's the problem. So many who classify it in that way do so with the thought of trying to force people to be quiet about their faith. That you keep it just a deeply personal matter and that you don't speak about it. You don't try to talk to somebody else about the Lord. You don't try to convince anybody else about the truth. That is not biblical. Our faith is a deeply personal matter, but it is not a private matter. And also, between listening and doing must come this careful consideration to which Jesus makes reference in the text before us this morning so that we don't go off half-cocked, that we consider carefully so that we know the truth and so that we can carefully express the truth to others. In this text... Jesus likens believers to lamps or to lights. He employs a metaphor which he used on a number of other occasions as well during his ministry. A metaphor that he used to describe Christians both personally in terms of what they are, that they are lamps, that they have a purpose and that purpose is to shine. But also then, uh, not only what they are, but in terms of how they should behave, that that light should shine, and it should shine out and not be covered in any way. It's a metaphor that Scripture inspired, or that God used, uh, inspiring other Scripture writers to employ for the same purpose. Uh, in Colossians 1, for instance, the Apostle Paul says that he, Christ, has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves. God rescued us out of darkness, spiritually speaking, and brought us into the kingdom of his Son, who is the light of the world. And so, even though he doesn't say it directly, we understand that it's biblical that he brought us from darkness to light, and we are to live in the light. 
We aren't merely in the darkness at one time and then brought into the light, but we are to live, Paul says in Ephesians 5, verses 8 and 10. We are to live as children of light. For the fruit of light consists in all goodness, righteousness, and truth. And find out what pleases the Lord. The Apostle John in his first epistle, as we're been, we've been studying that through in the last few weeks, we're reminded that we're called to live in the light of God and to live in his love. The fact of the matter is that we need to be conspicuous Christians. Just like what Jesus talks about in verse 21. I mean, that's really a rhetorical question, isn't it? Do you bring a lamp into, or do, uh, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? We need to be conspicuous. That means we need to be noticeable. We need to let our light shine. I mean, after all, that's the purpose of a lamp, isn't it? And a lamp does not that does not shine is, is really a waste. Now, how many of you have used propane lanterns? A few of you. How many of you have used gas lanterns? Okay, a few of you. How many of you have never seen one or the other? In our day, <laughs> when we talk about lamps, we talk about battery-operated or, you know, LED lights and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, it's, this is kind of an antiquated uh, metaphor that, that's being used here. But the whole point of, of Jesus saying this, saying this is that we, we've been made lamps so that we can shine. And whether you want to talk about propane or gas or batteries or whatever... We need to have a source of power that can, be, can light us up as lamps so that our light can show or can be shown to the world around us. In Psalm 107, verse 2, we read, Let the redeemed of the Lord say so, those he redeemed from the hand of the foe. And in Isaiah 60, verse 1, we are encouraged, Arise, shine. For your light has come, and the glory of the Lord rises upon you. And just as Jesus, who is the light of the world, like the, like the physical sun, and we're like the moon, we reflect the sun's light. We reflect the sun's light, S-O-N, his presence into the world, as we would live our faith conspicuously. And so as we think about lamps and shining, that's the metaphor I'm going to continue on as, we, as I make several points in this message, that we are to shine. First of all, we are to shine where we're placed. Jesus talks about a lamp being set on a stand. Did you realize that God has a stand, a place for you to shine? And do you know where it is? It's right where you are, wherever you are. Wherever you are, be on a lamp. Don't cover, or be on a stand, I mean. Don't let your, your lamp's light be covered. Shine where you are. In Matthew, or Mark's 5, excuse me, we read, as Jesus was getting into the boat, the man who'd been demon-possessed begged to go with him. Jesus did not let him, but said, Go home to your family and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. We are to shine, to let our lamps shine in our homes, but we are to let them shine wherever we are, and sometimes we are to make deliberate advances into the world. <coughs> Excuse me. In Mark 16, verse 15, Jesus says, Go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. So shine where you're placed. Secondly, shine without fear. We're not to be brash, but we are to be bold. Because we don't need to fear that our light will be snuffed. God is providing the fuel that the light within us might be evident to those around us. In 1 John 4, verse 4, we read, You, dear children, are from God and have overcome them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. So we go boldly. We let our light shine without fear because we know that greater is he who's in us, who's lighting our lives up than he who is in the world. So don't snuff your own light trying to protect it because the only thing you really need to fear is not shining. Consider carefully 
what you hear Jesus says in our text. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what he has will be taken from him. Thirdly, we are called to shine brightly. Do not put a bowl over our light. And we can do so in so many ways. We can do so by fear and silence. We can also do so when we would engage in gossip, when we would be greedy people, when we would allow ourselves to become proud in front of others, or when we let our lives be ruled by lusts or spiritual indifference. Any and all of those cover our lamp and hide the light. We need to shine brightly. Those things that would get in the way of of, of the light shining, Paul says we need to get rid of them all. And he goes on and lists a whole number of vices and sins. I guess there is one thing that you and I need to do inconspicuously, privately, and that is to trim our lamps and keep them filled. And we need to do this regularly. We need to be refueled. That means that we need to be in a place where we can be refueled. We need to use the word and the sacraments, whether it's in worship or private devotions or group Bible study or opportunities for fellowship. We use the word and the sacraments to refuel ourselves, to keep the flame burning. Remember the foolish bridesmaids in the parable of the five wise and five foolish? Why were five wise? Because they kept their lamps trimmed. They kept oil for their lamps. Five were foolish because they had allowed their supply to run out. They didn't refuel. Consider carefully what you hear. Next, we need to shine that the world's darkness might be exposed. What Jesus said in verse 22 was not said from the world's perspective, but from God's. When he says, for whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out in the open. God does that because he needs our hearts and our needs and our sins exposed so that he can also deal with us and bring us to himself and work faith in our hearts. Now, it's not fun when those things are exposed, but it's necessary And we need to be lights that would expose the darkness in the world around us that won't make us popular for sure. But it makes us necessary. I read about a pastor who visited a prison camp, the prison camp at Dachau, Germany, immediately after the Second World War. At Dachau, over 200,000 Jews were uh, executed by the Nazis. When this pastor toured this chamber of death, There was a Polish soldier who had been a prisoner there for three years, and he recounted to to the pastor some of the horrors he had witnessed. The soldier told how the Nazis, just before executing a prisoner, would often send a, a letter to the family announcing that the prisoner was being transferred to a much nicer place. Then those prisoners would be led into a gas chamber that was made to to look like a shower, and 200 people at a time would be gassed and and, uh, killed. And then they would have their bodies transferred to a crematorium in the next room where their bodies would be burnt to ashes. The U.S. Army reached the camp near the end of the war before the Nazis could hide the evidence of their crimes. The pastor commented, he said it was horrifying to see with what exactness, scientific precision, and utter inhumaneness this thing was carried on by highly educated, civilized people. He said, the only writing I saw was a plaque in in the cremation room stating, cleanliness is our watchword. Be sure to wash your hands. Isn't that something? Wash your hands. Don't worry about your hearts. Don't worry about the sins you commit. Don't worry about the atrocities. Sin needs to be exposed. Darkness needs to be brought into the light so that it can be dealt with. Evil men don't want their evil deeds exposed, but they need them exposed. While it is yet a day of grace, they need them exposed so that they can be forgiven. One day Jesus will return and the day of grace will become a day of judgment. 
So don't worry that many won't like your light shining on their darkness. Because if only one out of a hundred is helped, what's the problem? Isn't it worth it? For sure it is. Jesus said, I tell you in the same way there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous who do not need to repent. In in uh, just a few verses later, Jesus said, in the same way I tell you there is rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. See, not even the world really wants total darkness. Have you ever been in total darkness? Anybody? Yeah? My experience was at Wind Cave in South Dakota. How, some of you, where were you at? One of the caves like that? Yeah? Did they pull the joke on you where all of a sudden the lights go off and the, the guy leading the, the uh, tour acts like this is a big accident, totally unexpected, just to see if he can get a few panics going? <laughs> That's what they did at Wind Cave. But it was amazing to be in that place, down in that room, and there was no light coming from anywhere. The world doesn't want total darkness. The world needs light. It needs the law. It needs order, and it recognizes it. But it needs an even greater light, the greatest of lights, the light of Christ. So shine, shine your light that your life might bring glory to God. Be conspicuous. Shine your light. Hold high the torch of salvation. Be conspicuous in living out your faith. You have and you can share what the world needs more than, than anything else as you would share the light of Christ with those around you. Shine. Be conspicuous in your Christianity. Let's bow for prayer. Father in heaven, Thank you that you sent Jesus into this world, that he is indeed the light of the world. And thank you that you have graciously not only called us into relationship, but you have determined that you would use us to shine the light of Jesus in our day. Help us, Lord, to shine our lights. Help us to be conspicuous about our faith. Help us, Lord, to be daily replenishing the supply of oil or power that we need as we would come to you in your word as we would take advantage of the means of grace. But Lord, as we are refilled, then help us to go back out into the world and shine our lights that we might bring glory to you by the lives that we live and that your kingdom would grow as a result. In Jesus' name we pray and for his sake, amen. Dear friends in Christ, in order that you may receive this holy sacrament worthily, you should diligently consider what you must now believe and do. From the words of Christ, this is my body which is given for you, this is my blood which is shed for you for the remission of sins, you should believe that Jesus Christ is himself present with his body and blood as the words declare. From Christ's words for the remission of sins, you should in the next place believe that Jesus Christ bestows upon you his body and blood to confirm unto you the forgiveness of all your sins. And finally, you should do as Christ commands you when he says, take, eat, drink of it all of you, this do in remembrance of me. If you believe these words of Christ and do as he therein has commanded, then you have rightly examined yourselves and may worthily eat Christ's body and drink his blood. You should also unite in giving thanks to Almighty God 